this is the greatest story ever played. I'm Dan, and today I'm actually not going to be talking about video games. Instead, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, my 10 favorite books that I read this year. If you follow on Twitter or, uh, of course, through various episodes, I'll bring up stuff I'm reading or maybe stuff that I'm reading that's related to the video games we're talking about, that sort of deal. Yeah, you can probably tell. I'm a big reader. I like books. I like reading them. I like listening to audiobooks. That's uh, my other hobby besides video games. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to spend some time and talk about that. Figured some of you guys might like to hear about that. So with that, yeah, since there's not video game talk, if you uh, want to drop off, uh, by all means do so. That's cool. Otherwise, though, what I was gonna do, what I'm gonna do, is just go through uh, my ten favorite books that I read, and then I've got uh, some feedback at the end from some of your favorite books that you read this year. So, with that, I'll start at the beginning. And what I decided to do was write down my favorite books in order that I read them in. So it's not a, you know, this is book 10, and then I go to number one as my most favorite. Instead, it's just, uh, you know, this book, I think the first book I think I read in January, but it's just easier to keep track of it that way for me. So that first book, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire by J.K. Rowling, came out in 2000. It's the fantasy genre, of course. And uh, description, uh, you probably all know, but... Harry Potter is midway through his training as a wizard and his coming of age. Harry wants to get away from the pernicious Dursleys and go to the International Quidditch Cup. He wants to find out about the mysterious event that's supposed to take place at Hogwarts this year, an event involving two other rival schools of magic and a competition that hasn't happened for 100 years. He wants to be a normal 14-year-old wizard. But unfortunately for Harry Potter, he's not normal, even by wizarding standards. And in this case, different can be deadly. I actually, later on in the year, end up finishing the Harry Potter series. But this one was my favorite. The fourth book. It was my favorite, I think, because of this coming-of-age time. You know, some of the other ones, Harry Potter and his friends, are, fairly, are, are pretty young. In the later ones, you get into more dark magic, which there is some cool stuff with that too but this is right in that kind of moment of transition you get this uh, cool competition between the schools rather than uh the normal you know uh competition between the houses at hogwarts so that that was a cool change i think it was the right blend so this one really hit home not that i didn't like um any of the other books uh instead i liked all of them this one was just my favorite and I like, too, that Harry and friends are pretty used to magic at this point. You know, a lot of things are pretty novel in the first book. The first couple of books are like, oh, magic, you can do this, you can do that. Instead, everyone at this point is pretty used to magic. Uh, Harry's fourth year, so he's midway through Hogwarts. He's feeling a bit more comfortable. Everyone else is. Um, and you, as the reader, have been used to the routine, something that's really nice in these books is it starts off a couple weeks before... Uh, summer ends, Harry's with the Dursleys, and then it ends up going through the school year and the adventures that ensue along the way. And so this was a cool breakup of that too, of, okay, there's a different competition. It's not just uh, Harry and ha and um, Gryffindor versus Malfoy and Slytherin or, you know, that kind of thing. Instead, the competition changes a, a bit and uh, different story things that come with it. So it's awesome. If... Uh, Somehow, you've never read Harry Potter. Highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, I remember reading the first couple books as a kid when they came out, but I actually fell off. And so this year slash last year was my first time actually going through all of them. And it was fantastic, even as an adult, like uh, for the first time, basically. Because I didn't really remember much from the books as a kid. So highly recommend it. If somehow you haven't participated in any Harry Potter, definitely do it. It's worthwhile. It was awesome. Very, very good. Okay, next book I've got is called The Circle by Dave Eggers. It came out in 2013. It's a sci-fi novel. And the description for this is, When May is hired to work for The Circle, the world's most powerful internet company, she feels she's been given the opportunity of a lifetime. Run out of a spiraling California campus, The Circle links users' personal emails, social media, and finances 
with their universal operating system, resulting in one online identity and a new age of trans transparency. May can't believe her great fortune to work for them, even as life beyond the campus grows distant, even as a strange encounter with a colleague leaves her shaken, even as her role at the circle becomes increasingly public. I found this book noteworthy, so as, as it said, kind of the setting for this book is she works at this company called The Circle, and it's basically like if Facebook and Google and your bank account and like Apple all were married and everything was one thing. And so it's it's pretty crazy this world they build with one online identity. So instead of having all these varying platforms, instead everything centralized and um, are kind of subsets of the circle almost. It really hits if you had kind of one internet of sorts, one thing like that. But I don't know, some of that uh, privacy stuff is, I don't know, thought provoking. Some of it's concerning. Uh, for sure, just the ideas put in it. And, you know, there are some benefits, you know, like one of the, this is super minor, so it's not a real spoiler, but something that does come up in the book briefly is that they vote in their elections via their circle profile, and the, their, the circle will pester them to vote until they do, you know, things like that. And, uh, you know, on one sense, convenience is very nice there, and that's not a bit, not bad. On the other side, there's kind of an apprehension, like, I don't want the this um, company to be involved in how I'm voting or something like that. You know, it, it, it kind of touches on both of those. And this book uh, seems to be pretty love-hate for people. I, I've read some people online basically t uh, say this book sucks and, you know, they're alarmist or, you know, blah, 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 that sort of stuff. And then I think I've seen other people kind of be like, eh, they might be on to something. So, I don't know, it's probably somewhat polarizing uh, for people. So, take some of this for what it's worth. It may not be for you. It may be. Uh, it, it struck a chord with me, I think, that those things being separate, even just seeing, I don't know, all the stuff that's gone on on Facebook or something over the last year and getting hacked and finding out multiple times that different people have your data and stuff like that. And, there's some alarms in that regard, and so I don't know if I would want my whole life centralized on any one of those places at all, you know. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I don't know. I thought that was noteworthy. It was thought-provoking for me. That, that was my thought. Also, I know that there was a movie that came out about it, or based on it, with uh, Tom Hanks and Emma Watson. But for some reason, I've heard it's not very good. So I haven't watched it. I'm sort of surprised a movie with both of them would not be good, but apparently it wasn't. I'm not sure. Maybe you've seen it. Maybe you feel differently. If you've seen it, let me know what you think also, but as a forewarning. But I guess that's the circle. So I will move on to the next book, book three, which is called How We Love. Discover Your Love Style and Enhance Your Marriage. Um, and this is by Mylan and Kay Yurkovich. Uh, it's published in 2006, and uh, it's about marriage. So <laughs> the description of this book is, In How We Love, relationship experts Mylan K. Yurkovic draw on a powerful tool of attachment theory to show how your early life experiences created an intimacy blueprint, or imprint, an underlying blueprint that shapes your behavior and beliefs, expectations of all relationships, especially your marriage. They identify four types of injured imprints and that combine in marriage to trap couples in a repetitive dance of pain. So what I found interesting about this book is that it talks about how growing up and how your life experiences and your family and your parents' marriage or whatever, that you bring all of that with you to marriage, which of course makes sense. But more than that, that there can be kind of ways that can naturally play out due to your upbringing. I found this to be pretty helpful. I'd never really thought a lot about that. Like, oh, I have these experiences growing up, so I think marriage should be this way. Or my wife had experiences like this, and so she feels like marriage would be this way. That sort of deal. Um, so it was thought-provoking for that. I found this to be helpful. It got me to kind of consider my life or marriage at a different angle so to speak. So in it, they talk about four relational styles that people can end up in. Um, they have the avoider, the pleaser, the vacillator, and then chaotic. 
and how these can kind of impact your marriage. So maybe you're someone who avoids conflict and whenever it comes up, you try to get out of it or uh, perhaps you're the pleaser. So when someone tells you to do something, you try to please them and do what they want or that kind of thing. And depending on how you grew up, you may be more inclined towards one of these things. So I found this to be uh, thought-provoking, helpful considerations. I, I identified with some of the things in there. I felt it was useful. Yeah, it also talked about, um, yeah, right, how the styles maybe have come about or could have come about, perhaps in your relationship with your parents or whatever. But then also it talks about what can happen if, like, the pleaser marries the avoider or different kind of combinations in the uh, potential fights or difficulties you could have with that in mind. So I, I thought these were helpful. I think another thing that was helpful um, with this book is just going for acknowledging, of course, we all have baggage. We've No one grew up in a perfect family. No one themselves is a perfect person. You're going to bring things with you into your relationships. And here's a way to show some light on them and be able to think about them, perhaps lean against negative tendencies, um, be aware of maybe negative tendencies your significant other could have, that sort of deal. So I thought it was helpful, made my top 10. Uh, next up is The Culture of Fear, Why Americans Are Afraid of the Wrong Things. And this is by Barry Glasner. It came out in 2000, and it's a sociology type book. A uh, description of this is, in this eye-opening examination of a pathology that has swept the country, the noted sociologist Barry Glasner reveals why Americans are burdened with overblown fears. He exposes the people and organizations that manipulate our perceptions and profit from our anxieties. Politicians who win elections by heightening concerns about drug and crime, even as both are declining. Advocacy groups that raise money by exaggerating the prevalence of a particular disease. TV and news magazines that monger a new scare every week to garner ratings. So this book puts forward essentially that Americans end up being afraid of incorrect things. So, you know, the real fear should be something that's not really being talked about, but the fear that's getting pumped up uh, via media or politicians or whomever is actually not as bad as uh, they're making it seem. So one example of this uh, was like dying in a plane crash. So that fear gets pumped a lot. You know, you could die in a plane crash. Um, and, you know, when a plane does happen to crash, they make this huge, huge deal about it uh, and say, you know, you could die in a plane crash. You could die. Like, make sure this doesn't happen to you or something like that. And really a very, very, very low number of people die in plane crashes versus if you took something like a car accident. That's actually happens far more often and people get in car accidents much more frequently and can die from, you know like things like that but you know there's not a warning every day on the news like you could die in a car accident there, there's not that um, despite that it's more prevalent and more likely for you or another one they went through was uh, that I think this was a thing that was in the 90s where it was hot i don't think i've seen this as much but the whole like road rage thing road rage it could happen to you you could be driving to your car minding your business and then some psycho attacks you like that i, I remember seeing news things like that in the 90s but uh so I, that would probably fit with this book but so that was something that got pumped up a lot um back then this is this hype train on the news you could be a victim of road rage. How do you defend yourself? What do you do? What what signs to watch for? Something like that. When really the amount of road rage that happens is pretty low anyway, where you know someone gets attacked. But then even more so, how much of that is random strangers who you know you got cut off and then they ran you off the road and beat you up or killed you? Like that's a actually a fairly low thing that could happen. Whereas instead, there could be conversations about things like gun laws. Well, what if that person didn't have a firearm? Would they have been able to do this? What if, uh, what about car accidents in general? Again, uh, back, I guess, to the plane thing. But, you know, what about car accidents? You're actually far more likely to die in a car accident on the way to work rather than being a victim of road rage. Th these kind of things. So it, it was helpful in... 
I guess just kind of considering, okay, what are they saying is the problem, or what is it actually, you know? Uh, the news will make you, the news seems to put forward that crimes are happening all the time, and they do, but it, seemingly there is actually less crime going on today than there was, you know, 50 years ago or something like that. So I thought there was kind of a healthy, there's um, some skepticism that helped bring there, and kind of showing... Yeah, you're, they're having you look one way when maybe you should look another. The next book that I really liked uh, this year is called Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse in the Age of Show Business. This is by Neil Postman. It came out in 1985. It's also a sociology book. It says, uh, the description for this is, Television has conditioned us to tolerate visually entertaining material measured out in spoonfuls of time to the detriment of rational public discourse and reasoned public affairs. In this eloquent, persuasive book, Neil Postman alerts us to the real and present dangers of this state of affairs and offers compelling suggestion to how to withstand the media onslaught before we hand over politics, education, religion, journalism to the show business demands of the television age. We must recognize the ways in which media shape our lives and ways we can, in turn, shape them to serve out highest goals. You can kind of see what kind of reading I was into at this point. I don't know, maybe June or something. <laughs> um, but uh, Musing Ourselves to Death, I, I thought this book was fantastic and would be one of my favorite of my top ten, uh, too, even. But this one, uh, likewise, pretty critical of media and specifically that it gives you the smallest amount of information to feel informed but maybe not but not actually being informed as much so for instance if you see on the news that there was a natural disaster or um you know a gun at uh, an attack somewhere you see it they talk about it for two or three minutes really fast give you highlights and then move on. And so for you, as the viewer, for me, us, it can feel like, oh, I am I know about that thing. I, I knew there was this attack or I knew about this natural disaster across the world. Well, sort of. I do know about it in the fact that I'm aware of it. But I couldn't tell you any more than that. You know, if I'm given three minutes of information, I might know all three minutes, but I really might know one. I might know... Oh, there was a giant hurricane in Asia or something like that. That might be the limit of my knowledge. That's not really good. I'm aware of it, but also it doesn't really compel me to do anything. I'm just like, oh, it happened. That's not really a good thing. I'm not actually informed. It's certainly not going to change what I do. Being aware shouldn't be the real end game. Uh, <laughs> instead, I would think news should compel us to... I don't know, think or act differently or consider things is what he kind of puts forward. And uh, another thing he talks about within the book is that with something like news, so he's pretty critical of television as a medium in itself and n not so much for entertainment. He's not really ragging on entertainment. Uh, he's like, entertainment is what it is. Instead, it's a lot more of things that appear to be serious or are supposed to be educational or, you know, things like that. And they're not as much. So, and specifically, the news gets the brunt of his uh, uh, takedowns or whatever. But the one thing he brings up regarding the news is you have uh, your newscasters. They're people who are informing you about all of these things, but they're not really the best resource. Instead, they're a person who probably looks good and speaks well, rather than being someone who's, you know, informed and expert, um, you know, different things like that. If we're getting knowledge, essentially, just from a person who got it from another person and, you know, things like charisma or looks or being tall, that stuff's being maybe weighted more highly than it should as opposed to something like facts or logic or you know, that sort of deal. So we kind of contrast those. Yeah, I found this, uh, of course, very thought-provoking in uh, the world of uh, quote-unquote fake news that we live in. You see that on uh, both 
sides of the aisle in uh, American politics, and I don't want to get into that because um, you're not here for that either, I don't think. But um, <laughs> yeah, but you see it everywhere, um, and both sides, both uh, groups of people regarding any views, really say that the other one could be fake news or different things like this. So this is pretty helpful in evaluating content, where it comes from, who it comes from, you know, that sort of thing. Found this super helpful in that regard. Also, this book is short. It's like 150 pages. Um, chapters are short. Uh, you know, they're like 10 or 12 pages each. Uh, the book's small, even. Uh, <laughs> I ended up actually reading this book on my lunch breaks at work. So I, I think I got to read it over a, a couple weeks or something like that. And just go on lunch and read for a bit. And I found it super thought-provoking. Highly recommend it. Highly, highly recommend it. It was very good. So got that. Next up is uh, interactive storytelling for video games, a player-centered approach to creating memorable characters and stories. This is by Josiah Leibowitz and Chris Klug. It came out in 2011. It's about game design. Description of this book, what really makes a video game story interactive? What's the best way to create an interactive story? How much control should players be given? Do they really want to that control in the first place? Do they even know what they want, or are their stated desires at odds with their unconscious preferences? All these questions and more are examined in the definitive book on interactive storytelling for video games. You'll get detailed descriptions from all types of interactive stories, case studies of popular games, including Bioshock, Fallout 3, Final Fantasy 13, Heavy Rain, Metal Gear Solid, uh, and how players will interact with them and a number of in-depth studies and results a national survey on player storytelling preferences in games, you'll get the expert advice you need to generate compelling and original concepts and narratives. I thought this book was super interesting. You know, obviously I like games like this. Obviously if you're listening, you probably like games like this too. Um, <laughs> and when I heard about this book, I was like, all right, why? What's, what's the thing that clicks? What do I like about it? What draws me in? Um, what makes them good? That sort of thing. So it was pretty helpful from that side of things. I'm not, you know, looking to design a game or anything like that, but I imagine for someone who is, this would be especially helpful. One of the guys uh, has worked in the game industry for a long time, and the other one uh, I think has a little bit, but is more of a journalist, I think. I'm, I might be wrong about that, but I know one of the guys definitely worked in games for quite a while. And so it's cool hearing um, from each of them. They have, they'll have personal experiences. They'll do uh, sections on a game and why it was impactful in a certain way or different kind of storytelling, so uh, interactive storytelling. So like open world versus like open world, so that would be like your RPG style, versus like a branching path, which my understanding would be like um, a heavy rain or Detroit Become Human where what you do can kind of impact how you get there, or then, you know, something that's more regular interactive, like a Telltale game, where you're kind of going to go where you will, more or less, and have some choice along the way. Um, so it was cool. I, I thought it was pretty interesting uh, to hear from these people, and, I don't know, get this almost inside look at games that I enjoy. My only... Uh, sadness maybe in this book is that it was in, it came out in 2011 so a lot of the awesome storytelling games uh, that have come out since of course are not included so I kind of hope they do a revised edition uh, sometime and you know you could add the multitude of great story games that have come around since in there uh, that'd be pretty cool so I like that quite a lot I guess for reference for this book for some reason, uh, at this since this book's a little more quote-unquote academic or more specific, I couldn't actually get it at my local library. And I don't know, I think it was like 30 bucks on Amazon or something like that. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to shell out that kind of cash. So what I ended up having to do was get it from my state library, which is connected to like all the universities around. So if you're interested in this book and maybe can't access it at your library either or... You know, you don't want to spend 30 bucks or whatever it was on Amazon. Uh, your universities around you may have it, and that might be a way to get a hold of it. But um, definitely recommend it. I thought it was thought-provoking. Definitely cool in reference to this podcast and games played and thoughts that come from that. All right, next book is Fever Dream 
by George R. R. Martin. Uh, this came out in 1982, and this is horror novel. Uh, and description for this is, When a struggling riverboat captain, Abner Marsh, receives an offer of partnership from a wealthy aristocrat, he suspects something is amiss. But when he meets the hauntingly pale, steely-eyed Joshua York, he is certain. For York doesn't care that the icy winter of 1857 has wiped out all but one of Marsh's depleted fleet, nor does he care that he won't earn back his investment in a decade. York has his own reasons for wanting to traverse the powerful Mississippi, and they are none of Marsh's concern. To be none of Marsh's concern. No matter how bizarre, arbitrary, or capricious his actions may prove. Marsh uh, meant to turn York's down York's offer. It was too full of secrets that spelled danger, but promise of both gold and a brand new boat that could make history crushed his resolve, coupled with the terrible force of York's mesmerizing gaze. Not until the maiden voyage on his sidewheeler, Fever Dream, would Marsh realize he joined a mission both more sinister and perhaps more noble than his most fantastic nightmare and mankind's most impossible dream. Here is the spellbinding tale of a vampire's quest to unite his race with humanity of a, a garrulous riverman's dream of immortality and of an undying legends of the steamboat era and the majestic and ancient river. So this book's pretty cool. I like this one uh, quite a bit. It's like Dracula meets Tom Sawyer, basically. So you get Dracula, you get vampire stuff, you get lore, you know, information like that. But then it's set on the Mississippi in the 1850s, so it's very reminiscent to Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn and their adventures and that sort of deal. So that was a pretty cool mix. And earlier this year also, I did read Dracula and I read Tom Sawyer. So it all felt like home. Everything felt familiar in the, in this book being there. I'd read both of those books earlier in the year, and so it it, it felt familiar, but uh, was a new story that was cool and you know putting vampires in a unique situation. So I thought this was pretty cool. I liked it a lot, and this is actually the first George R. R. Martin book I'd ever read. And this actually convinced me that I should read Game of Thrones. It also, I'd, I'd watched the first two seasons of Game of Thrones before reading Fever Dream, but this made me be like, okay, you need to get back into that. Um, you liked it before you just let it fall off. So, went back. So, this is probably a, I'm probably one of the few people in 2018 who got pushed into Game of Thrones because of Fever Dream. <laughs> kind of a weird uh, way in, but it was cool. Fever Dream's not very long either. I think it was like 300 pages or something like that, so it's it's reasonable sized, and it was really good. It was really cool. Definitely recommend it if you liked Dracula or Tom Sawyer or vampires in general. Definitely recommend it. I thought it was cool. The next book I read, obviously, fits with the one previous, which was Game of Thrones. Uh, George R. R. Martin came out in 1996, this fantasy novel. Description for this is, Long ago, in a time forgotten, a pre-natural event threw the seasons out of balance. In a land where summers can last decades and winters a lifetime, trouble is brewing. The cold is returning in the frozen waste of, to the north of Winterfell. Sinister and supernatural forces are massing beyond the kingdom's protective wall. At the center of the conflict lie the Starks of Winterfell, a family as harsh and unyielding as the land they were born to. Sweeping from a land of brutal cold to distant summertime, kingdom of Epicurean plenty, here is a tale of lords and ladies, soldiers and sorcerers, assassins and bastards, who come together in a time of grim omens. Here is an enigmatic band of warriors, bear the swords of no human metal, a tribe of fierce wildlings carry men off into madness. A cruel young prince, dragon prince, barters his own his sister to win back his throne. A determined woman undertakes the most treacherous journey of journeys. Amid plots and counterplots, tragedy, betrayal, victory, and terror, the fate of the Starks, their allies, and their enemies hangs in the perilous balance as each endeavors to win with the deadliest of conflicts, the Game of Thrones. As I said... Fever Dream brought me here. Once I started watching the show, I was like, this is great. I should I should read the novels. I liked Fever Dream. So 
I started, of course, at the beginning with Game of Thrones. What was super helpful with this book was since I was um, re-getting into the TV show, reading the book really helped with the names, <laughs> actually, in the beginning, because I'm like, okay, I know you, uh, I know you, getting a, a better lay of the land, too, um, because I had the words in my head from reading the book, but then when I'd sit down and watch, I'm like, okay, I know this, or I know that, and that sort of deal. So that was pretty helpful as well, definitely a side benefit. And yeah, this year really became a Game of Thrones year for me that I had not expected. So I got caught up with the show. It's great. Love it. Can't wait for it to come back on the air. I read this one, and I read uh, the second Game of Thrones book. It was also very good. And i uh, been playing the Telltale Game of Thrones game, putting episodes out on that once I got caught up enough in the TV show to uh, not have the game be ahead of it. So super awesome. Really, really cool uh, just having Game of Thrones in my life now or whatever and getting to enjoy it with everyone else and am uh, surprised and disappointed that I missed out on all the before, but I'm excited to be a part of it with everyone now. And it's great. It's super cool. If you've uh, managed to avoid Game of Thrones thus far, I highly recommend watching the show or reading the book. Either way, it's quite good. All right, next up. If I had to actually rank my number one book, I think it's probably this one. This one or Amusing Ourselves to Death are probably uh, my absolute favorite. So this one is called City of Thieves. It's by David Benioff. Uh, Benioff came out in 2008. It's historical fiction. Description for this book is, During the Nazis' brutal siege of Leningrad, Lev uh, Binyev is arrested for looting and thrown in the same cell as a handsome deserter named Kolya. Instead of being executed, Lev and Kolya are given a shot at saving their own lives by complying with an outrageous directive. Secure a dozen eggs for a powerful Soviet colonel to use at his daughter's wedding cake. In a city cut off from all supplies and suffering unbelievable deprivation, Lev and Kolya embark on a hunt through the dire lawlessness of Leningrad and behind enemy lines to find the impossible. By turns, Insightful and funny, thrilling and terrifying, City of Thieves is a gripping, cinematic World War II adventure, an utterly intimate coming-of-age story with utterly contemporary feel for how boys become men. That, that's the story. I, I actually picked this book up because I'd read that Bruce Straley had said that this book was a huge influence on The Last of Us when him and uh, Neil Druckmann were writing The Last of Us and making the game. And... Reading the book, I definitely could see it uh, and how this was an influence. I thought that this was very, very cool. I would uh, love to see City of Thieves as a movie or play it as a game uh, or anything like that. It was awesome. I really liked it. David Benehoff also actually is one of the showrunners for the Game of Thrones TV show. So that's kind of a funny connection point as well. But fantastic. I really, really liked this. I was a huge fan, was uh, gripped by it. Like, I was excited to get to hear more of the story every time I went back to it. And, yeah, super enjoyed it. Also, it got me more interested in Russian literature and Russian, Russian history at large. So, Kolya is a university student, or was in university before World War II broke out. And so, he references a lot of Russian lit as he goes, and... I've never read any, but I definitely am planning to in 2019. Uh, yeah, this really got me interested in that. I did read a book on the Russian Revolution, which was solid, but I liked that this inspired me to do that. So, I don't know. It was cool. Definitely highly recommend it. Very much so. Enjoyed it. Okay, last book uh, that I wanted to bring up is called The Insanity of God, and this is by Nick Ripkin came out in 2013. This is a biography. The description of this is, The Insanity of God is the personal and lifelong journey of an ordinary couple from rural Kentucky who thought that they were on just your ordinary missionary pilgrimage, but they discovered it would be anything but. After spending over six hard years doing relief work in Somalia and experiencing life 
where it looked like God had turned away completely and he was clueless about the tragedies of life. The couple had a crisis of faith and left Africa, asking, uh, asking God, does the gospel work anywhere when it's a really hard place? It sure didn't work in Somalia. So that's the description. So what this book is, is, so the first, the beginning part is about this guy's life, trying to be a missionary in Somalia, and it doesn't go great, and he ultimately leaves. And then after this, he and he ends up going and visiting varying countries around the world that had a, a Christian presence in like a persecuted nation or where it wouldn't be allowed. So he like visits former Soviet Union area. He visits China. He visits uh, places in the Middle East, you know, th things like this, like places where Christianity wouldn't be. Um, and he ends up meeting people there and hearing their stories. And what I really appreciated about this book and thought was good about it is it wasn't, I'm the author, look how great I am, you know, look how much God uses me or something like that. It wasn't any of that. Instead, he was meeting these people in super tough circumstances and they had faith in God and stuff like that and share their stories and I, I don't know. I found it impactful and noteworthy. Uh, I thought that just hearing what their faith was like was pretty interesting and, I don't know, inspiring and stuff like that. I liked that. I thought it was cool. Um, and just seeing the faith of people around the world in tough circumstances. I thought that was pretty noteworthy. And, you know, again, like I said, it makes them look good. It makes the people he hears about look cool. Like, a, I don't know. Hearing their story was cool. It wasn't about him or something like that. So I like that because sometimes books are not that way. So <laughs> so that's my top 10. Now I've got a little bit of feedback from other people. So Dave Triggs on Twitter, he wrote in and recommended In the Eye of the Wolf, which is a book he wrote, actually, and I think came out this year. I'm, I'm not sure. I have not read it. Yeah, that's awesome. Congrats on completing it. Uh, I've never written a novel. That's super cool to pull that off. Good dork. Good job. Uh, next up, we've got Chris on Twitter, and he says, I want to try listening to the Mass Effect Annihilation audiobook, but I haven't got around to it. Yeah, that's cool. I um, am still... I haven't played the Mass Effect games. That's definitely a gap in my playing... From what I can see, it looks like you can only get uh, the newest one, not from the original series, on PS4. So I might need to borrow a PS3 from someone or maybe buy one, I don't know, to be able to go and play that series because that seems to be a must play for anyone who likes these kind of games that we like. So, uh, but also I think that's cool that the game has an audiobook. That's, I don't know, a sign of popularity that's pretty cool. Uh, next up, we've got Gabe on Twitter, and he said, uh, Daredevil Born Again. So that's cool, continuation of uh, Daredevil's story. That sounds awesome. Then uh, Thomas on Twitter said, Robert Heinlein's Have Spacesuit Will Travel was a lot of fun. If you like witty banter as much as I do, the plot is fairly basic but has a lot of pleasingly weird elements, and the two main characters were some of the most amusing I've seen on a page. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> that sounds really great. I think I, I'm, I'm actually, I've added that onto my 2019 book list. I'm going to try to read that sometime next year. It sounds like a lot of fun and sounds like something I would want to read. So that's awesome. Uh, Nikki on Twitter uh, said Uncharted, the fourth labyrinth. They both die at the end. Simon versus the Homo sapien agenda. Mass Effect, Andromeda, Nexus, Uprising. Buffering by Hannah Hart. Scythe, the Pottermore ebooks, and I'm currently reading the first Game of Thrones. That's awesome. Uncharted, that sounds really cool. I think once I finish all the games, I will probably go read that too. Um, <laughs> more Nathan Drake, I'm in. I'm interested. And then uh, I also read Scythe earlier this year, and I really liked it. Um, Scythe is really cool. It's uh, set in this future world where people can't die anymore physically. Like, they've... Um, cured death but so that the world isn't overpopulated you have people called scythes who are required to glean which is kill a certain number of people they have a quota of people they need to kill each year uh, that they're authorized by the government to do 
so that uh, society doesn't get overpopulated. So it's this pretty unique world, and you get a good story. I think that this personally will end up being the next Hunger Games. I think once uh, they're they're developing a movie, from my understanding, I think once this first movie comes out, this is going to be huge. I think this is going to be the next Hunger Games for sure. So I recommend it. I really like the first book. I read the second one also. It was all right. I like the second one a lot, or the first one a lot more, but it's uh, I think it's worth checking out, and we'll definitely finish the series when the third one comes out. I haven't read the Pottermore books, but I'm definitely interested. Love me some Harry Potter. And yeah, and that's cool that you're reading the first Game of Thrones. That's awesome. Uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So uh, yeah, that's what I've got. If you've got books that you really liked in 2018 that you didn't um, write in about, please write in. I'm always looking for more books. If you have things you think I should read next year, I'll definitely uh, look into them. That'd be cool. I guess that's the episode. If you've got any other uh, comments, questions, please write in at the greatest story ever played at gmail.com. Find us on Twitter at StoryEverPod. Yeah, we will see you next time. 